and the pressure started there of course not that you, if you if you want to do the job you must take the package flew out of Lanseria and we land here Rangers media all over the show I came back we we took a bit of leave sat at Balito on the beach and and tried to think uh, we came I came into the park alone and I, I knew it, it would be tough. I knew that the situation was dire, but nothing can prepare you if you start living it day by day. So while I see all of this, uh, a wise man, I think Napoleon once said, what is a good general? Is he a tactician? Is he intelligent? Is he a strategist? He says, there's only one good general, and those who win. And I realized within two months, it cannot be done in months. The numbers the intensity, the protracted nature, the never-ending nature of it, that I was not prepared for that, that I must admit. And I think for a lot of us, and, and Lou mentioned at the start, we, it is, uh, can be an incredibly demoralising uh, situation that we're facing here where we get numbers all the time. But, but, but back then, incredibly confronting figures there. Uh, the numbers of rhino being lost per day. Give us a feel for that and, and just that massive task that you had because it's, it's, I find it's easy for us to all become fixated on the numbers and if you just look at the numbers of rhinos killed, which is shocking enough, for me what I learned from, from Johan was the scale of the problem was even, even bigger than those numbers reflect. One had to focus, one had to avoid emotion. You mustn't do it emotionless. That, that, that would also not work. But you fly in with the helicopter and there are three rhino lying on the area the size of a rugby field. You lose three a day, sometimes over a weekend, full moon you lose 11 rhino. You lose 800 rhino mm. that year. It's not made up. On average, eight new incidents a day. And we would only cite an incident if it was fresh tracks, a fresh camp, visual contact, or the, the exchange of fire. This African bush, you don't know what's happening there. You, you, you low funders know it very well. Those, those were the numbers. It adds up to 2,500 of that a year, which was more intensive than in our infamous bush war. And I'm not dramatizing that. And, and you add to all of that what, what is happening. What, what must you do while you act now? while you make sure you put in your best effort. Yeah. And I mean, just the, we, we, most of us here would know and online would know Kruger, but when you think of it as a thousand kilometers and the size of a, of a small country, and yet here you are standing with 400 men and women to try and defend that area, it's almost impossible. Well, two, two million hectares. Amazing, yeah. yeah. And, and I think, as I said, for me, it was uh, the scale of the problem and those numbers of poaching incidents every day, as you said, with thousands, literally thousands of poachers against a force of 400 rangers, of course, not all of whom will be on duty at any one time, and, and I think under-resourced and under-trained. So, so tell us about your mission. What was the brief you were given originally and how you set about going uh, and addressing that? The, the brief was a simple one, paramilitarise the rangers. If only, if, it, if only it was that. Remember now, I see what is happening in front of me, and... You, you realize to, to paramilitarize them, they need to be structured, leadership, training, the right equipment. You, you then have to look at facilities, you have to look at the whole team, and, and as we went along, get force multipliers. It'll take 2,000 troops to safeguard Kruger. That's undoable, that's not affordable, and you'll swamp the place with guns and aerials and land rovers. So, the, the brief was paramilitarized, and I started with the Rangers. You get hardware and software. I started with the wetware at the time. And give us a feel for the, I, I think, the, the, the situation with the Rangers at that time when you, when you came into Kruger, the attitude, the, 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 the command structures yeah. that were there, and, and, and the words that were perhaps given to you by David Mabunda and other people as well. Remember, I took over six months after that total strike. And the one thing that I did from day one was discipline. I would not renege on discipline. To do that in our country, even at this stage, we didn't have trans a prolonged transformation, less sensitivities. Uh, and I could only get through this, and forgive the I message because I said the example. 
One had dust on the boots, one was present uh, around the clock. And that, that is why I could pull through with the discipline. You, we then had to immediately look at structure. Who reports to? You, you had to look at logistics. The logistics system was not geared. And if this sounds critical, it's not meant to be. It's not that I lay it in front of somebody. The logistics system could not support them. The training at the time was, was inadequate as was the equipment. And then the ranger wellness, despite the discipline, one had to work and focus on the ranger wellness, their families in, in themselves, their being, what it does to them to read in social media, maybe we should uh, give this rhino to people that can protect it. And then, but I've always remembered two specific things. David Mabunda said at a breakfast we had before I came, he said, General, if you fail, you try while you fail. You fail trying. And then six months into this, the chairman of the board, Kuseni uh, Tlameni, uh, led forward. He said to me, when will the numbers come down? Uh, now, now talk about a little bit of pressure. So <laughs> while I did all of that, I realized we have to communicate. I must tell the leadership. And now the general, and then I realized I have to tell, let's say, the nation. South Africa is angry, even now. And that is why I befriended the media uh, on, on a scale that was never done before. And the fact that we trusted the media, we never lied to them, bought space to this day to say, yes, it's still not where we should be, but at least look what is being done. Yeah, I think Johan just made a very important point there. We, between us, we set out a couple of aims when writing the book, and, and one of them was to not be critical, not to criticise individuals. But the fact is you were bought in because there was a need for, for reform and, and change that had to go there. And then as we spoke, and Johan recounted a number of incidents to me, what we tried to do was show the state of things at the time in 2012. And I think he's the first to admit that it's not as though nothing had been done. Good work was being done. People were working hard. People were under incredible strain at that point when he came in, which is one of the reasons why he came in. We showed the state of things there. You know, extra rangers had been recruited, but Johan touched on logistics. It was a matter of things like um, uh, housing and uniforms and equipment still having to come through. And so we see in the story how his, his initial uh, efforts very, very quickly in, in, at a period of intense pressure um, start to bear fruit. And I, I can sing his praises, I think, better than he can sing his own praises because he's not that sort of person. But what we tried to do is to say, not just say, this is a terrible problem, it was a mess, but, but to say what the situation was and what needed uh, to be done. I mean, it, it, it struck me early on that uh, this was going to be a story about change and, and, and change management as well, too. So having done your appreciation as a military commander would say and do. Um, how did you set about formulating your strategy? And perhaps you can talk us through that in, a, in an outline sort of form. Strategy is important. Uh, but culture eats strategy for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> if you cannot change the being, the minds, the people that come with you, you will have strategy. And I've been disillusioned so many times since my MBA days with strategy that is not working. The, the, the grand strategy was clear the park from the outside. You've got to start in the consumer countries. You work through the networks. <coughs> Remember that. You work into your own country, then next to Kruger, and then inside Kruger. Yeah. That, like the layers of an onion. Yeah, I, believe, I believe that there are five levels. Uh, the five levels of of uh, in, the, in the whole rhinos, rhinos um, poaching scenario from, from the people on the ground all the way up to the international syndicates and so forth. So it's a complex matter. You, you have to clear the park from the outside and in your country you must, you must collapse the networks. Inside the park, it was being persistent and unpredictable to be able to protect, to react to incidents and get ever more proactive with more intelligence. You cannot wait till the thief is inside. That was how we approached it, and that is how we structured, that is how we trained, that is how we equipped. Yeah, as I said, it was very interesting for me to look at, to step back and see the story, to look at the, the scale and the scope of the, the tasks that had to be done. And the other thing we were keen to do 
in, in the story is to, to ensure that the rangers emerged for what they are. That is the heroes of this story. And again, I'm kind of under orders from our publishers, Pam McMillan, not to give away too much as in, as in the books. But a uh, couple of things that, that surprised me, I can say surprised me other than the scale of the problem, the efforts of the men and the women on the ground. This is also a book that has a number of strong female characters in it. Because what we were doing to illustrate the story and the progress that Yaham was making was, was to look at how the Ranger Corps changed, you know, their dress and bearing, their new sense of pride that he was able to give them. We talk about a number of measures that he brought in to, to improve their pride and to improve yeah. their morale. And uh, as, as part of that strategy, not just on, on what you might think of uh, as the more military side of things, being able to respond to contacts. Uh, we also looked at, uh, very much look at the welfare of the Rangers. And, and in fact, um, Johan's wife, Irina, actually played a, a quite a large role in that, in that as well. Can you tell us a little bit about her, her involvement? The Ranger Wellness was close to us, and it came to a, at the end of year one, to a very specific point when Irina and I, that year, on 24, 25, 26, did a Christmas visit throughout the park all 22 ranger posts. And we got back home and she said to me, it need not be like this. You don't need a ranger post to be a pit. Uh, she's gonna do something about it. Thanks, Nicole, I thought, I was hoping for one, but that's okay for now. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank and you. so she started Project Relax with direct support as always from the honorary rangers, uh, f full support. Uh, by the way, even even the equipment that we bought, even the training that we had to pay for, an investment in the air wing, an investment in the canine wing. And that is how Project Relax was born. You started making it livable. There are people coming there for weekends and for holidays, put the jungle gym there, put cooking facilities, have a booster so that they can call home. She later did Project Veggie, so that you plant vegetables and work in the ground and get some nourishment from it. Project Bafana, get small soccer teams together while the rest are in the field. It was, it, it was so important. It came just at the right time, and if we believe that, that the, the your human capital is the capital, we must never stop that, and specifically now with the honorary rangers involved in Project Embrace, looking at resilience, how do you manage stress? It's a good general that not only addresses issues such as the morale and the welfare of the rangers, and their, and their well-being, but one that actually puts those things into, into practice. And, and Arena, as I said, and as Johan mentioned, was very much a part of that. For me as a novelist, the, the temptation in this book was to, to really delve into and go hard on the action side of what was going on in this struggle, because this is, as Johan mentioned, a very intense uh, level of conflict with a very high level of operational intensity. And again, perhaps more than some of us might have realised, that with multiple contacts, uh, gunfights, for want of a better word, or incidents of arrests between poachers every day at the height of this. Uh, and as we show in the book, as things get better and, and, and the Ranger Corps is increasingly better equipped and motivated and command and control are streamlined and we see other assets coming online, such as aircraft with the help of the honorary rangers and, uh, and other force multipliers that we'll talk about, to use a military term. We see this level of, of, of intensity just escalating as, as more and more is happening every day. We also took a decision to not go to town too much on that. We, we didn't want it to be gratuitous. So what we look to do is in the course of writing the book is to just have a couple of snapshots that, that put us on the ground, and, and, and Johan, you've, you've made some excellent observations that have been quoted around about what the real Kruger is like, as opposed to the Kruger that I dare say most of us um, experience. Perhaps tell us about that, and, and maybe just give us a little bit of a feel for, for what it was like on the ground for those men and women, and just how hectic it was. Well, I dealt with the dark side of Kruger, the iconic Kruger. Everybody said to us, so lovely, you'll stay in Kruger now. Uh, one is not lamenting, one ended up doing your 90 hours a week ar around uh, because there was no other way. It's not as if you have staff and plenty of staff that you can delegate to. And uh, as you start supplying, as you help, our motto with Project Redax was people won't care to listen until you show them you care. And as that started happening, we got through, we pulled through at a cost. 
the, the damage that is done to relationships and families and marriages, that is all on our account, on all of our account. And we had to give, we had to be merchants of hope constantly without spinning the thing because I remember they there, you cannot tell them anything about it. And that is why we resort to other methods, to alliances, technology, because you had to give the guys a break. You couldn't just put them on head on and not do other things. Yeah, it was very difficult for the rangers at the time because most rangers would train as conservationists mm. and they'd want to spend their lives in a conservation scenario. And then what was happening there was they landed up in a military situation where they would, in fact, be, um, their lives would be in danger at times. So, so th 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 people must have been extremely demoralised. It was also an incredibly demanding environment in which to work, not only the scale and the size as well too, but you know, we, we look at the, the difficulties of operating in somewhere like Kruger. I mean, it's chilly enough as we sit here indoors in a, in a lecture room here in, in White River, but to be out in the bush in the open in the middle of winter at night time, to be on patrol, to be chasing people through the bush during the heat of summer, and doing that day after day after day. I mean, it was, it's incredibly stressful. Perhaps give us a, a little bit of an insight into some of the other risks or dangers that, that rangers face, perhaps not just in the field. A, a ranger in an anti-poaching situation, there's a risk of getting killed or maimed or badly injured. There's a risk of conviction. Every time there has been an exchange of fire, there's a fatality, a murder docket is opened. That person now goes home for weeks on end with that on his or her uh, mind. Of course. You have the stresses in the marriage, in the relations, because you're distressed and you cannot offload. You have the stress of being alienated in your community. Saturday morning in the spur in Kutlu, it's not like we see them. And then with time came the, the scourge of corruption. Now you run a risk of being betrayed. And, and, and that is how you left. And I say again, that is why we had to add any other means and method to, to ease the burden, knowing that technology makes things possible, only people make it happen. Tell us about some of the things that worked well in the context of your strategy, initiatives and, and programs and, and things that you introduced. I always said at the time that it's a complex problem. You don't solve a complex problem with a complex solution. You sell it with a composite solution. And that is why alliances was very high on my list. The, what we could do in Mozambique, what we could do west of Kruger with the private reserves, that added real value as we worked that into the strategy and the plan. When, I, when we started in 2013, almost 80% of poaching occurred for Mozambique. By end of 2014, we had it just over 30% against, against just all odds. So the alliances to this day, the GCAPs of the world and the Nampopo National Park, and that's the only way to go, public-private partnerships. Technology, despite the mistakes that we made, worked for us. To this day, the rhino are protected primarily what I call by a radar bubble. It won't do the job completely. We have to do technology. The rangers deserve their slice of the fourth industrial revolution. That's one way of giving them an edge over the poacher. And whether it's a piece of night sight equipment or whether it's a radar or something more, more expansive. So the, the fact that you could tap into people around you in your cloud, not an IT cloud, in the cloud in which you live here in Hellofeld, between the R40 and the La Bombo Mountains. And the fact that one had access to technology and could slowly phase it in with money that we had to get from donors. Yeah, so, so clearly uh, funding wasn't a problem then, or was it a problem? Because with the technology, etc., you tend to have a situation where you really need a large amount of funding. And uh, that was how, be, did, how did that go? That was going to be another question I was asked. Oh, yeah, okay. so well oh, done, Lou. Okay. Yeah, curious. Yes. Tell us, how do you raise the money for this sort of endeavour? I message again, I could mobilise 400 million in five years. Um, the course is just so good, you must communicate a little. To this day, if we had the legs to go fetch money, there's almost unlimited money for nature conservation. It's the, it's the age of earth and brown and conservation. The, the lovely story about, and it's written up in a book, is one morning, five o'clock, just because of, before I go for a run, to quickly check my tablet and there is a mail that says, I'd like to have dinner with you once I'm in South Africa again. H.G. Buffett. 
I didn't go, even go for a run. I just <laughs> sat there and, and drank more coffee with a lot of... Long story short, I met him 22 December, a butcher shop in Girl Sandin City. Had a discussion. Now, he's a wealthy American, so it's 9-1. He talk 9 and you talk 1, but we live through that <laughs> also. <coughs> and he, he said, if you give me a submission by 2 January, I, I think I will help you. 2 January, we, we gave that. My family was here. I was uh, working that New Year's Eve in Pretoria. I came through the next New Year's Day to, to meet up with him. And in the Rosebank Mall, uh, March of that year, 23 March, if I remember correctly, Standard Bank, Minister Mulewa was there, Mr. Gordon was there, ach, and everybody <laughs> of, of the conservation world. And he gave us 255 million rand without a condition, a five-page contract. There was one condition, and it was typed in bold, Clause 8. Clause 8 said, in Buffett terms, I give this funds as long as U.S. manages it. And it says a follow-up sentence, if you remove him, I move my money. It changed my life too. This, to this day, I suffer from that well meant. <laughs> you can think, what the heck would the leadership say? This is collusion or whatever. But yes, there was the buffer, 255 million. He visited me a little while later in the park. I took him and, and Kelly, his chairman of his board around. That evening, walked into this Kakuza golf club for a function with the police. He called me there. He said, buy a chopper. Another chopper sent me the invoice. Unfortunately, as you know in the book, there's the dark side of that also. But that was money. Well, I had to find money for everything that I did because there was none in the, in the kitty. Sure. So tell us um, a little bit about some of these. We used the military term before about force multipliers. Tell us about those and, and as well as technology, also dogs and other things that were we'll able to employ in the park. The, the, when we looked at the strategy and we, we were outnumbered and overwhelmed, you couldn't pluck all the holes. We started working, we doubled the Special Rangers. We doubled the air wing, fixed wing, and, and the rotary wing. Um, we, we expanded the inv uh, investigative capacity. Yes, and canines. Started with six then, built the canine center here in Epaben, and today I have over 60 of them, and it evolves. In 2014, we started with money from the honorary rangers to have the first trials with the pack dogs. And today it's primary, it, it, it reduces the risk. You don't have a contact anymore where the ranger is at risk or where the poacher can be, uh, get fatally wounded in the process. Dogs as important as technology, if not more. I mean, as with other elements of the strategy and seeing how the rangers develop, we also do have a couple of stories in there about notable dogs, some of them who've been probably known to many of the people here. Killer, who was responsible for, for so many arrests as well too, and another very unfortunately named dog. But there's a, there's a very good progression in there. And the interesting thing for me was to, to learn that uh, not only are dogs now uh, a factor in so many arrests, in, in, in the vast majority, I believe, in some cases, but also the fact that they have saved lives because the increased use of dogs then brought down the number of, or the risk of and the number of, uh, of armed uh, contact between rangers and poachers. So I Indeed. guess it's fair to say that, they've, that they save lives as well. Indeed. Yeah. Um, so given the, the application of technology, the, the things that worked in the strategy, the alliances, was, it was fascinating for me to learn about that. I mean, you... I read and I hear and I want to focus on things like the choppers and the gunfights in the bush and things like that, but that's truly strategic thinking about engaging with people on the outside, the use of technology, the dogs, the increased air wing. What were you able to achieve over those, those few years that you were there and the time after? The numbers did come down eventually. It, it took us, it was a runaway train, it took us more than two years just to stabilise it. Two years during which you have to manage your self-life. I was on a contract. They could have fired me if they wanted to, for other reasons as well. Uh, they, you, you, you had to keep your public informed, your political leadership, your, your donors. But the numbers came down. People now say there are only fewer rhino killed because there are fewer rhino. Of course it's a factor. All in all, that is, uh, the, the threat is the same. The demand is the same. It's a smaller area and the threat has been displaced. For a long while, Kruger was our Ukraine. They bore the brunt, 
And everybody was specialist, everybody was expert, everybody wanted to help, and some helped and others didn't help, with due respect. That was, that was the, the situation, and even so, we could stabilize and get the numbers down. The population that is there, I think reportedly less than a third left, there's less than a third left, but they're there, they're free roaming, and they set to grow. Because we've contained it in the IPZ within a stronghold also, and then in the book we mention in, in middle 2013 I was invited by Property McQueen and his team to go work in the other six national parks. So we were proactive there. We implemented everything in a smaller scale. And for the past five years, amongst the 600 national rhino parks, never more than five rhino in total loss. So it can be done. That was particularly interesting, I think, to just because, again, we tend to focus on the big numbers and we focus on the Kruger Park, but, but that, that idea, as Johan mentioned, of Kruger bearing the brunt, being the Ukraine of the fight, and that then buying time for the other parks to, to improve their level of security, because he was also able to, to observe and, and to, I guess, if not educate, work collaboratively, collaboratively with them so that they didn't get into the same situation that Kruger was. And I think it's fair to say that while the poachers are, emerge as a very skillful and nimble sort of enemy who changed their tactics, I think that was probably a case where you were ahead of the game. Tell us a little bit about poachers, some of the myths and misconceptions or your view of the, of the adversary that you were, you were up against in the park. Sometimes, I must admit, I have very unchristian thoughts about those fellows. <laughs> I am also South African enough, civilized enough, and Christian enough to realize that many of them have no option. And if you look at the two million people west of Kruger, it's a, it's a fault line. It's a fatal fault line that we will have to find the wisdom to manage and do something about. Mm -hmm. Many of them just have no option. How they lured into corruption, how they lured into the park, how they lured into crime, and soon, Poverty and greed creates a toxin that becomes toxic and you have poaching. Many people say they have high, they have high tech stuff. They have nothing. They have a second hand pair of North Star tackies, clothes in tatters and a little bag with maybe some bread or fish or something. Some of them carry drugs and some of them uh, carry uh, liquor that they, they will have probably a sundown of that by Namang or what while they're in there. And then, of course, just about all of them, the string from the Sangoma that makes them invisible uh, after they've been blessed or uh, uh, entertained by him. A hardy group of people that are desperate enough, especially once they've hunted, and the, 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 the distances they can cover, coming quickly cover 25 before daylight, how they survive in a big five park with sometimes almost no water, I sometimes did, I had to admit, that's gutsy what they do and how they live. I suppose, I suppose they get exploited, you could say to a certain extent, because how much do they get paid for what they do relative to what happens at the other four levels? So it's, it's a form of, of explo exploitation. We can't, we, can't, we can't justify what they've done, but it's also, as I said, a form of exploitation. Mm. Indeed. Yeah, I mean, we show a scene recounted by one of the section rangers of poachers being dropped off at the border of Mozambique by their boss in a Range Rover to, to walk oh, in from really. Mozambique. So you can see where the, the money is further up the line. Um, we, we touch on the, the plight of... Um, of orphan rhinos in the book and, and the change in the approach to dealing with orphans. Perhaps tell us a little bit about that. I'm sure many people would be interested in that side of the, of the fight, if you like. When I come, came in as a latecomer from outside the conservation world, which, which posed its own challenges also, the, the conservationists were very pure about it. You don't touch the animal, it will be no good, we don't do zoo. That night I just must my feast on the thing. And it just became too much, and we started evacuating them to care for wild. And I visited one day, and I realized just what they do. And I saw the plan that they had from this baby that you have in your house, literally, later in a bigger pen, later a bit bigger, ultimately walking with some adults. Ultimately, we could uh, relocate some of them. And this year, 
two orphans, two babies were born in the orphanage. One year in Careful Wild and one in Eastern Cape with uh, Dr. Johan Joubert there. It plays a role today. We have eight such sanctuaries or orphanages throughout the country with between 150 and 200 rhino. It offsets some of the poaching. And why not? And why would one not save them? Uh, specifically, not with the noble intent that it makes you feel better, get them back into the wild. So it actually becomes almost like a key plank of the strategy. And from a, a human interest point of view, uh, to, to round out Johan's stories, I was able to interview a number of rangers and, and other key players in this story. And uh, again, I don't want to give away anything, but there are some very moving scenes of these uh, tough rangers who have had to make that transition, as Lou said, from a, a conservationist role, someone whose primary mission is to care for the environment and look after the day-to-day -day management of the park, to becoming, you know, warriors, if you like, and then having to deal with all that brings with it in terms of the stresses of being in these dangerous life and death situations and having to cope with the day-to-day -day grind of action. Yet, as one said, one thing that he just couldn't deal with was the fact of, of as Johan said, this, this idea that it was best just to leave these orphans in the bush and let nature sort them out. It's incredibly moving. But as he says, it's more than just a, a PR uh, type of thing. So I guess the, the big question is, and, and, and I would encourage people to read the book, but most of it is, is Johan's story and it, and it follows his time in Kruger and afterwards. But um, we, we do end up with, with your, perhaps getting back to your original intent of sharing some lessons learned in a pricey form. Can you give us a bit of an idea of, of where do you think we should be we should be heading? Perhaps not where you should be heading, but yeah. based on your experience, how what lessons would you like to, to see um, carried forward? I really don't like old generals writing biographies <laughs> <laughs> and memoirs. Now this thing is now a memoir. <laughs> I have some consolation in that it's about only three years in in arena in my life, maybe a bit more. Of the 18 chapters, only two talk outside that. And in the last chapter, chapter 18, I, I venture there. A, and I have no doubt about the humble advice I give there. Let's sort out core business. Let's gear up for the long run. PPP, public-private partnerships. We cannot do this in South Africa without the private sector. The private sector now owns more than half the rhino in this country. They're not a majority stakeholder, they're a majority shareholder. And the civil servants will have to start living with it. While you build resilience, while you streamline, uh, do new funding models. There are exciting ways of getting money out of this system with the carbon credits and the conservation tokens. It's a new asset class with limitless possibilities. If you have the guts to do or all the paperwork. I still believe in technology. There's got to be a way, how else do we want to do this? Do we want this forever to go on? Because they'll clear Africa out ultimately. And fortunately they're not doing it because we have, we organized well, we're equipped well, throughout now almost as a norm, there must be a technology solution. Even up to a satellite, even to a drone, even to magnetic detectors. I firmly believe that we must invest in it, and that will require courage. Janssen was national chair of the Honorary Rangers when in 2013 I realized we have to do a technology roadmap. Now that sounds fuzzy, man. That sounds like a consultant who wants money. So he ignored <laughs> me. <laughs> Three weeks later again, I didn't know him well. He says, Storm's business by me, and John Turner, I called again. I said, he says, what will you get for it? I say, a paper. He says, nee. Okay, ultimately he got therapy, they gave me a million rand and we worked for nine months before we understood what technology is. It's not weapons of mass destruction or something <laughs> that you need, but you've got to learn that. It's, you cannot Google it. And yes, of course we had good and bad experiences of which the lessons one can share now. So you've been away from Kruger for what, five years now, relative to the position that you had there? Uh, how, how would you see it's going now? Uh, having, I'm sure you've looked at it over the last five years in terms of, of the progress. That's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, out of, I'm out of Kruger seven. Good faith. <laughs> I'm, I'm out of Kruger seven years now, and I'm out of Sandpark three years. 
I was very fortunate after this to do the other 22 national parks, and specifically the Rhino Parks for okay. two years. Then the late Minister Muleva, for my great respect, it's written up like that, said I must help the provinces. Guys, to this day, the provinces are bleeding, they're suffering, it's not going well. And then the PPF appointed me three years ago and seconded me to the department so that one can keep working on national uh, level and make sure that we get the best of all resources. Whether we like the police or they like us, we must start liking each other in this country because we have what we have. Post-COVID, there are no more resources. Put together what you have, coordinated best you can, and get some traction. It's happening on our beat. We don't have options. So Perhaps be, before we go to the questions, I, if I could just wrap up uh, from my perspective working with Johan. As I said, I have done biographies, never with someone as well prepared or as knowledgeable as this. Um, and, and I guess it was my job, if you like, to, to, to look for the, the personal stories and to try and dig those out, what Arena was up to, what the Rangers were up to. It is, a, it is not just a general's memoir. It is, I believe, a, a, a piece of South Africa's history. And it's told not only through his, through his eyes, but through the deeds and actions of many, many brave men and women. Um, as a novelist, one thing I need is, is inspiration. And inspiration can just mean stuff, ideas for a new story or a new book. And there was no shortage of stuff in this book and in Johan's story to, to fill 80,000 words of a book. But inspiration also means to be inspired, to be uplifted. And if you have read my books, you probably know I'm a bit of a sucker for a happy ending. I'm an Australian who buys property in South Africa. I'm an optimist. <laughs> but I, I, do, I do think that there's a strong message of hope in this book and we were able to show it through a couple of anecdotes and stories. And although I'm not supposed to reveal them, there is one that sticks with me and it is a moment when Johan is given advice by a, a psychologist to take two female rangers out of the line to give them a little bit of a rest because of the level of intensity of action that they've been in, the traumas they have witnessed, the daily grind of seeing rhinos killed and being in, in danger themselves. And he does. He goes to these uh, lady rangers and, and says politely, I think it's time that we give you a rest. And they say, no, General, we are staying. And I don't know about you all and our uh, uh, viewers there watching us on the live stream, but to me I find that very inspirational. Johan is an inspirational figure. Thank you very much for, for taking the time to listen to us and we'll take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you very much, Johan. It's great to have you, as I said in the beginning. We'll have a Q&A session now. I'm not quite sure how much time we have left. I would assume that we're on track. Yep, we've got about 12 uh, minutes or so. so oh, we good. Yeah. We just want to make sure that we don't get this going through into the uh, load shedding period because it won't, won't be on live stream. Uh, if you do need some help from the top there with the roving mic, uh, we have two boys from one of the schools here who are very avid conservationists, and that's the reason why they're here, so they'll be helping us out a little bit tonight. So uh, any questions, is, uh, just put your hands up, and then, okay, there's a question over here. Good evening, and uh, thank you for coming out to speak to us. I just wanted to ask what the results have been with your engagement with the end user. You mentioned that in the book and you mentioned, you alluded to that again now this evening. Has there been any kind of progression in terms of that? There has been, but I'm, I'm not so well versed in it. Remember, that was the thing big part. There are only two strategic solutions, community ownership and demand management. And I know of so many projects by NGOs, our own diplomatic corps and political leadership being involved there. It is just hard to say across the cultural divide what is happening. But if I see the busts, if I see the sentences and the frequency of it, there is progress. It's hard to say. And it's a pity that one cannot say. And with due respect, and don't quote me, what do you say to China? Uh, and, and the problem is we don't understand the market. I've heard people that say if we sell the horn, we can saturate the market. That I know is not true, not by a far cry. 
It's, it's, it's just too hard to say what the progress has been. We do know now that apart from OTOP is taking this as an aphrodisia or something, it is affluent people that use it, mostly. And it is as much artifacts and bangles and trophies as it is medicine uh, for cancer. But still, we, we don't even know the market segment. I think it's, uh, it is a very good question and, and I, my role in the Australian military was very much on the Army PR side of things, which these days is called strategic communications. And I think it's something that's often paid lip service to, but needs perhaps to be better resourced in terms of, as Johan said, finding out more about the market. I mean, I was involved with a, a small NGO from Australia that did quite good work in, in, in investigating the end users and, and came up with what Johan's talking about, that. I think the, the marketers in the user countries, are like the poachers, are very clever. They change their spiel from aphrodisiac to cancer cure to now status thing, and it becomes, it plays on people's base emotions. And uh, yeah, I mean, my two cents worth as an outsider is I think that that's an area that deserves more money, more attention in terms of perhaps strategic communications, influencing campaigns and stuff. And one of the things we do touch on in the book is, hey, if all the other players internationally and nationally around the place had put in the effort that the, the Ranger Corps in Kruger had done to changing the way they do business, to better resourcing themselves and adapting, then there's lessons to be learned there, I think, for, for all sorts of players. Mm, great. Uh, another question? Questions? There must be plenty. <laughs> the, uh, the names of some of the kingpins behind the poaching are known and well known live in Matsinjia. Why has they ne have they never been extradited? Has the government never applied to have them extradited into this country? One of them is actually charged with murder here. The collapse of the networks here in the Lowveld, in Gauteng, and then across our boundary is, is the, the only thing we can do to get to a strong one. What we have is a moderate one, hard one. To get to a strong one, we have to collapse the networks. We all know there has been great progress, Kakuza Court, uh, consistency with bail conditions, consistency with sentencing, shorter turnaround time. The fact that we cannot extradite, uh, it is on the table. By the way, that's one of the conditions to legalize trade. Uh, there are about 20 conditions set, and much of it is to do with safety and security. So, Jeremy, I have no answer for that, it hurts. And uh, Mozambique, they does a lot themselves, but the kingpins there, they, they roam free. And to an extent here also, and with due respect to the police. The horn that comes from here, some go to Maputo, some go to Durban, for more than a decade, 80% of that horn go to Gauteng. How is it that we don't intercept it? I call it depots, and we're working on that now with the King Scorpions. I call it depots. How many depots are there in the, in, in the, in the bigger job again? Six, ten? That is where we should eat. And, and they, they know my viewpoint, but I'm not saying that as a person, not as a Department of Environment. Yeah. If we want a strong one, we must collapse the networks. The, the victory of anti-poaching will not occur in the bush. It will occur in the boardroom where the right decisions are made, and in court with the right convictions are meted out. Uh, questions? Uh, Rail? Hi, thank you, Lou. Um, General, can I just ask, um, just a fundamental question is, is, it might sound a bit strange, but can a rhino save itself? You're talking about uh, potential partnerships with the private sector. From a sustainable use point of view, can that rhino, but when I say can the rhino save itself, can, can, that, exi can that existence value actually work in the favour of the subpopulations and would actually do away with a lot of the, the military need for the fight as a way to sway the war in the favour of the conservation? I've often said that the species must help us save the species. It will not be, it will not be that simple. Uh, if you talk uh, harvesting and, and have a sustainable income, it can be done as long, uh, specifically in the short run, you'll destabilize the market. We've not tackled the economic dimension of this war as yet, and it can create a breathing space and much needed income. Let's not go legalizing of trade, that's something diff different. If, if we must have 
if we must farm with 5,000 rhino to have 10,000 roaming free, it makes sense to me. But that's not an official viewpoint at all. Before I go to the next question, how much time do I have left? Could be four minutes. Four minutes, great. Yeah, we just don't want to go over time. I think probably uh, one more question. I'm sure there's lots, and afterwards, besides, we will be able to have lots of chats. Uh, thank you. Is this on? Uh, General, just a question. Um, you referred to taking risks. I would be interested in the kind of risk assessment and the risk management in the boardroom of some of the solutions that you are suggesting. Because some of the solutions may not be that obvious. And one hears a lot and reads a lot about experts who have ideas of how to solve this problem and where to solve it. How did you go about innovating and managing that risk of innovation? And you very kindly mentioned uh, using the CSIR to, 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 to look at the quality of the innovations, technological innovations coming through. But my question is really risk management. How, what is your message to the directors in the boards of how they should be looking at risk management? A few things come to mind immediately, and it's fundamental also. Buffett said to me, now who's Buffett, ultra-rich person, he said to me, if you fail, fail fast. And he said to me, don't hesitate to fail. One will not easily have that luxury again. On the renewal part, Janssen, it was extremely cumbersome. Because you do it concurrently, you go fetch money, you talk to the media, you have dust on your shoes, and now you implement this, and it was really unnecessarily lonely to do those assessments. Where do you find the time and how do you facilitate these sessions so that you have all the buy-in and if you take everybody along? And I made a mistake there, uh, knowing uh, change management, that sometimes I moved too fast, I had to. And yes, I lost some of the people and you find that you insert technology, you mustn't insert it, you must embed it. You must make sure that you take the, the wet wear along, the people along, in a not so tech savvy environment. And I don't say all the renewal is only technology related, it goes for other methods also. The ranger's strongest point, they hit fast. It's also their weakest point. Because to take them along, uh, you've got to have a little bit more time to get around and to get the real buy-in. Okay, thanks very much. I think we're going to have to uh, give it um, a f finish off now. Uh, we, I think, just like these overseas networks, they say, "Well, thank you very much, but we have to go now. <laughs> we have to go on to something else." Uh, I, I don't want the load shedding to affect everything. So, once again, thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you for thank you. for the evening. Thank, thank you very much. And we wish you a very happy journey, both with respect to, to uh, launching the book, or at least uh, eventing the book all over, and also a very successful journey into the future, particularly with respect to DFFE and the work that you do in Pretoria, uh, Major General Eusta. I'm sure that with your, with your work there, you're in fact continuing the success story and we wish you a great deal of luck. And Tony, thank you so much for being the author that brings us all to us. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Let's thank, give you. Another thank you very much. Thank you.